What would you tell someone who, because I'm sure we both get this question a lot too, say you, you've really accepted everything you've said so far. I acknowledge, I go into the chapel, so I've set time aside, yep. which is a lot of times the biggest battle. I acknowledge to Jesus, here I am, this mm -hmm. is exactly who I am, it's, it's a good acknowledgement, this is my fears, anxieties, doubts, you know, these are my plans, whatever. And then, it, you know, I, I, I relate that to him. Perfect. And I don't feel or perceive or sense or whatever. I'm not getting a response. Very good. Very good. What's, okay. What's that look like? Excellent. So I do think uh, I, I like the way you set it up. I think for uh, my encouragement to people who want to commit to a daily personal prayer, whether that's 15 minutes, my, my uh, students, their daily assignment, <laughs> their daily assignment is 15 minutes of, their 17 year olds, 15 <laughs> minutes of silent, uninterrupted prayer silent, uninterrupted prayer. They can pray in their room, they can pray in a chapel, they can pray on their patio, they can pray where everybody needs to be silent, uninterrupted prayer, and then they, then they write one or two sentences on what their greatest, what they wanted most. And to be honest, what did you want most to, for the 15 minutes to be done? For me not to be distracted but when, when they start to get it, what you see in their journal entries is what I wanted most was to actually experience that God is real. And I'm not just talking to myself. Mm -hmm. When a person starts to get to those level of desires, you now have something good happening. But for the setup, if, if one wanted to commit to something like that 15 or 30 minutes a day, um, to start with, Jesus is standing before you, and this isn't make-believe. This is all true. In mm -hmm. fact, it's truer than we're imagining it to be. Right. Jesus is standing before one's heart saying, what do you want me to do for you? And you answer that question. Now, in answering that question um, is where the real drama begins. <laughs> because you're going, to, you're going to acknowledge that, relate it, and then... Um, what you're wanting to happen isn't going to happen. And so now you're really into real prayer. You're really into real prayer about, so Jesus, I really think I need this. I'm not experiencing that from you. Yeah. Why? Etc. And then friendship and lived relationship with God can begin. What then, more specifically, Father, what does a person have to do, especially in the beginning of prayer? When I say the beginning of prayer, I mean the first 20 years. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> the first 20 years of prayer, much of actively receiving is about actively rejecting that which is not of the truth. What this elder son needs to do to start actively receiving is he needs to start actively rejecting these silly thoughts in his mind that the Father isn't good to me, mm -hmm. the Father hasn't given me anything, the Father doesn't care for me, and he has to start, stop listening to them. Because that's what's driving him. What's driving him is all kinds of things that are opposed to what God has revealed. And so the first, the first um, step in actively receiving is beginning to actively reject all the stuff that's in us that is opposed to what God has revealed to us about Him and our relationship with Him. My good, uh, my good brother, uh, who's a priest, uh, Father David Richter, um, he made uh, the spiritual exercises, uh, St. Ignatius, 30-day sound retreat. And when he got done, we were having a conversation uh, a very deep conversation. I think we were both levitating at the time. <laughs> don't I? But I don't want that to be known. <laughs> um, and I asked, uh, I asked Dave, what, what was, like, what is the one big thing from your thirty-day silent retreat? How you pray four hours a day, four holy hours a day, uh, thirty days. You receive spiritual direction every day. So after all of that, yeah. right, one hundred and twenty some hours, blah blah blah. After all that, what is like your one big lasting grace? I asked him this a month or two after. 
and he very insightfully and humbly said the biggest the biggest grace for me was I realized I became aware of all kinds of stuff inside of me that I needed to reject. Mm -hmm. And because of that, I'm now experiencing the presence of God, the consolation of God, the closeness of God, which is reality, way more. Yeah. Actively receiving in faith usually begins by actively rejecting that which is opposed to what faith tells me. It's a huge thing. Yeah. So that would be, that would be a major <clears throat> obstacle, uh, Father Bauck. A major obstacle in prayer is people sit in stuff that is not from God, and they believe it. And so, and that's what's driving then all their thoughts and desires in their prayer, which again is a spirit that is opposed, I call it the spirit of paganism. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean that in a derogatory way, I mean it the way uh, we truly mean pagan. A person who sees God as someone you have to actualize mm -hmm. to show me goodwill. And so many people are spending their minutes in prayer um, doing that. And so from a Christian perspective, they're not praying. A great example would be, um, I've preached on this more than once, in fact, that growing up on a farm praying for rain almost destroyed my friendship with God. <laughs> Why? Because I imagined it yeah. as um, we need rain. God could give us rain. He's not given us rain. There is some good he could be doing that he's not doing. Um, and so by us exercising this, we actualize this good in God yeah. that, it, and that became the paradigm for all my petitionary prayer, which is thoroughly unchristian. That's Santa Claus. <laughs> That's right. As opposed to, right, the Christian vision is, uh, a good mom and dad, like my parents, raising, trying to, trying to uh, carry out their vocation. They're farmers. They have a great need, namely rain, or they can't feed us. So they hold that need before God and say, Father, this is the need we hold before you. We give you permission to do whatever you want for us in this need, because we trust in you. That is Christian petition. And when rain doesn't come, this Christian mom and dad don't conclude to God isn't answering or God isn't good, but rather, holy cow, holy cow, he is doing something greater than fulfilling our need for rain. Yeah. And we have a really great need for rain. Mm -hmm. So he must be doing something really great. Yeah. Which is precisely what the crucifix is about. The crucifix says, oh my gosh. Good Friday says, God must be doing something really great here. Because we need Jesus. And he's not letting us keep Jesus. That's a problem. Of course, he did something greater. <laughs> so actively rejecting is huge. But there's very few of us who wear clothes like this, right? Who are, who are actually helping people see that and understand. This is one of my primary, one of the primary things that is done when I give retreats to seminarians that helps them start something new. Oh my gosh. Monsignor, I have, that's all I've been doing the last three days is rejecting all this mm. stuff that I didn't know I was supposed to be. That's the first thing. The second thing, which would be another great episode, is a fundamental, a fundamental problem in the human heart ever since Adam and Eve chose, and we see it in Adam. We see it in Adam, and uh, the verb that is described is he's hiding. Mm -hmm. He's hiding from God. Hiding is uh, simply 
another verb of saying he's not relating to God. So you can bet you can bet your bottom dollar that Adam is filled with all kinds of thoughts. Yeah. He's filled with all kinds of desires. He's filled with all kinds of feelings in regards to his relationship with God, how God sees him, how he sees God, how this relationship is going, what uh, this all means now. He's aware of it, but he's not relating it. I have found the distance between acknowledging my need and relating it for, for us who have um, been affected by original sin is a massive sickness in the mm. heart. A massive sickness. Mm -hmm. So what um, I've coined, uh, and I trust the Trinity students would be able to say this very uh, proudly for you if you ask them, uh, un actively reject, and then the second thing is needs to overcome non-relational intellectual activity devoid of an I thou relationship. <laughs> say that again. <laughs> non-relational intellectual activity. So I'm thinking a lot. Non-relational intellectual activity. I'm thinking a lot alone. This is what's. This is the first consequence we see in Adam. He lives, he lives his relationship with God now in a non-relational intellectual activity devoid of an I-thou relation. He doesn't share his thoughts with God. And so this is a fundamental, um, it takes the effort of faith and hope every day to overcome non-relational intellectual activity. I'm sure it was always thus, but it only got worse with modernism. I think, therefore I am. Yeah. That the human mind, the human intellect, is where we go precisely when we need something mm -hmm. to figure it out. But there's no way Adam can figure this out. He needs to bring this. So, non-relational intellectual activity. The, the acronym... Uh, this is fun. So th the acronym we need to throw away and the one we need to adopt, the one we need to throw away is WWJD. That is paganism. For all of you wearing that plastic little, I don't take it personally, but you're going to agree with me in a minute. Uh, <laughs> WWJD is, an, at the end of the day, an unchristian question if you're asking it around the mystical life the, the lived relationship with Jesus. It's helpful, perhaps, dealing with moral issues. But what would Jesus do, right, can only be asked if you accept unchristian conditions. What would Jesus do, Father Dominic, if he was real? What would Jesus do if he was here? What would Jesus do if he is fa actually doing something? All of those conditions are precisely saying, what would Jesus do if he was like Abraham Lincoln, yeah. somebody in the past, not doing uh, anything now, and now we try to think about him the way we think about Abraham Lincoln. That is non-relational intellectual activity devoid of an I thou relationship. And the devil does that every day, all day. Right. What would Jesus do? The devil wears WWJD around <laughs> his wrist. That, that was a little strong. Okay. <laughs> the, 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 better, the better would be WIJD, what is Jesus doing? But that's still strange, right? So it would be strange if there was a third person here named Mark, right? right. And I turned to Mark and said, Mark, what is Father Bauk doing? Right. That'd be creepy you would say, just ask me, I'm here. That is always true every moment with God. That is true every moment with Christ. Christ is here and Christ is doing something. He is active. And so why wouldn't I relate to him? Now, it would also be strange, right, if you and I are sitting here and I start talking to Jesus. <laughs> we, can, we can talk about that another time. But 
So WWIJD is moving in the right direction. What is Jesus doing? But it's still not Christian relational prayer. Christian relational prayer would be J Wade, J W A Y D. If you want to make money, make bracelets with J W A Y D. <laughs> Jesus, what are you doing? Jesus, what are you doing? Is now relational, intellectual activity bringing me into an I-thou relationship. Prayer breaks down in many ways. One, if I'm not actively rejecting that which is opposed to what God has revealed. Two, if I'm not relating. And three, if I'm trying to get God to do my will. It will always fall apart and become a frustrating, discouraging, non-life-giving experience if in fact um, any of those things are happening. Why? Precisely because grace is not leading my prayer. My ego is leading my prayer. And that's always going to be a frustrated thing. It's not easy getting the God of the universe to act. Yeah. <laughs>